morning, everybody. Welcome this morning to the Tyler, Texas, Smith County Master Gardener Library Series. We are so happy you're here today. Uh, we've been doing this uh, with the library for about five years. This is our third in our five month series and uh, you're in for a treat. I don't think I have to tell you. You came because you heard the name, I'm sure. Um, this year we do have two more remaining lectures. Uh, next month in April, it will be on April the 22nd, which is not the third Friday, which the rest of them have been because of Good Friday. And that one will, our special speaker will be Jay White, he is the publisher of this magazine, Texas Gardener Magazine. So if you take this magazine, you know who he is. Uh, so we hope you'll be here for that. Um, and in May, we have uh, one of our own uh, Smith County Master Gardener speakers, Elizabeth Waldrop. And if you have never heard her speak, you need to come. She's going to speak on night gardens. And uh, you're in for a treat to hear her. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our Smith County, Smith County Master Gardener program. Um, we are a part of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Um, we are special, spe specifically trained volunteers, and we provide horticulture information, health, and education to the people of Smith County through the Texas AgriLife Extension Service. Our members go through 72 hours of classroom, followed, and this is to get certified, followed by a year of internship, and uh, we try to learn as much as we can about as, uh, as much as we can about all the different varieties of horticulture so that we can better serve you and the community. The training class is normally held the first three months of the year, January through March. We have had one instance because of the pandemic where we moved it, but if you are interested in becoming a Smith County Master Gardener, we are located in the lower level of the Cotton Belt Building on 5th and Houston. Our uh, help desk office is now in room 117 in the Cotton Belt Building, and we welcome you anytime. Uh, we also have a help desk phone number. Uh, that you can call and I had put the websites up on the screen before you came. I hope some of you took pictures of that. Uh, but if you didn't, we'll help you out with that. You can see any of us, any of us wearing badges will answer your questions about the organization. We have quite a few here today. Um, and if you want to see examples of our work in the community, please visit the Tyler Botanical Garden that's located in the Tyler Rose Garden. We. Um, take care of that but those gardens for the city of tyler and we're in there every week multiple times a week and every other weekend um, and it's beautiful if you haven't seen it go see it so now today's speaker is greg grant and greg is a well-known published award-winning horticulturist who offices in the smith county uh, Extension Office, and he is our Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service horticulturist. He is also our much-loved and appreciated Smith County Master Gardener leader. Um, we are blessed. <laughs> Too bad. He doesn't like to be bragged though, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it because I see a lot of people here that may not know his background. Uh, Greg is a writer, a photographer, a conservationist, and a seventh generation Texan from Arcadia, Texas. He is an author and or co-author of several great books, including In Greg's Garden, Erlen, uh, I'm sorry, In Greg's Garden, A Piney Woods Perspective of, on Gardening, Nature, and Family, Texas Fruit and Vegetable Gardening, Erlen Gardening in the South, Texas Home Landscaping, the Southern Heirloom Garden, and the Rose Rustlers. He also has a weekly column in the Tyler newspaper on Sundays. You don't want to miss that. It's always wonderful. And he has a monthly blog called Greg's Ramblings. He also has an article in, a column in the Texas Gardener magazine. 
uh, and it is called In Greg's Garden, and this month it's about spiders, so you might want to read that. It's pretty cool. Um, Greg has been featured in many magazines all over the United States, so we are very proud to have Greg here today. I think the most important thing I need to tell you, though, is he is a proud fighting Texas Aggie. Woo! He has two degrees from a &M, one in floriculture and one in horticulture. He has continued his postgraduate education with classes at LSU, North Carolina State University, SFA, and where he is also currently working on his PhD because he really gets bored. He just doesn't have enough to do. He has a long list of experience as a horticulturist from S SFA Gardens. I didn't call you up yet, sit down. <laughs> he has, uh, as a horticulturist with SFA Gardens, Mercer Auditorium, and San Antonio Botanical Gardens. He has been an instructor at SFA and Louisiana State, and a director of research and development at the Lone Star Brewers and the famed Antique Rose Emporium. So, you know a lot about Greg, there's a lot more to know, but there's not enough time to tell you. So I'm just going to turn this over to him, but first I want to let you know, we are recording the program today. It will be uploaded to YouTube next week, so you'll have to be patient sometime next week. Go to our website, txmg.org forward slash smith, or go to our Facebook page which is Smith County Master Gardeners. And if you're not a member of our Facebook page, get on it. We have lots of great articles daily and sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, also, please fill out your surveys that were left in the chair. And before you leave today, if you'll put them in the box. And if you stay, there's a table full of door prizes. We're gonna have a door prize drawing at the end of his lecture. And now you can come up. Oh. I do want to introduce a special lady in the audience. Greg's mother is here today and she's winching, so he must get it from her. But we are so happy to have her. She is a sweetheart. I was trying to say the embarrassing part when everybody realizes that I couldn't hold a job and so <laughs> yeah, you start figuring out the number of years and the number of jobs. I've only stayed about six months at each one of those. I saw horticulture like a trip to Baskin and Robbins, and I liked everything and wanted to try everything. And so, I'm settled down now. So, I, uh, it's important that y'all know this is recorded before one I say anything stupid because I normally don't like to be recorded. And so, you don't do anything stupid and make a scene or whatever because it'll be on YouTube. And so, uh, some people like to be on YouTube, but I'm assuming y'all don't want to be on YouTube because uh, I'll probably go on there and make comments too. And, point out what you did, actually did or didn't do. So you can actually go on YouTube and just search for Smith County Master Gardeners and there's a number of videos on there that we've done in the past. Okay, normally the Master Gardeners do this program, why we call it the Master Gardeners at the Library Lecture Series, but anytime folks are giving talks, I like to jump into the conversation because I get to get uh, topics that people don't normally request. So I have a list of programs and I'm always amazed that people always pick the same programs and I've got dozens and dozens that people never ask for, so uh, when somebody says you can do a program and pick the topic, I love to, to chime in with something fun. So today we're going to talk about butterflies. And you don't want to be a butterfly outside today because it's hard enough walking without flying. And so, what does that mean? Normally it's an alarm for Greg to be quiet. I, uh, I love flowers, and I think most gardeners love, love flowers. And we've got a number of master gardeners that are also master naturalists, so it's kind of um, kind of common if you're a, a gardener that you pay attention to different insects and, and animals and birds and that sort of thing. Of course, in the, in the gardener world, we often tend to look at uh, insects as a bad thing, but just realize there's just a small percentage of the insects that are harmful to our plants. There are a lot of insects out there that are just living their lives and feeding other animals. And then we've got some insects out there, like butterflies, that are just so pretty that I think of butterflies as flying flowers. And I'm the same way with birds too, so I'm just as happy with a butterfly 
or I was bird in the garden as I am with the flower. So you don't want to get so caught up in gardening that you're disappointed if you're not producing a flower or a fruit because there's plenty of other things uh, to keep your attention out there. And in just the last few weeks, of course, butterflies they kind of shut down during the winter time. As spring gets here, it's always fun to see the first butterflies come out. So they're normally associated with certain certain plants and certain times of the year. So I always think of the narcissus bloom. That's usually when I see the first tiger swallowtail. Uh, when the pawpaws start to come out, that's normally when you see the first zebra swallowtails and, and so on. There's a little uh, mustard relative in my woods. It's uh, a host to a, a orange tip falcate, a little tiny butterfly. And so when those things pop out in the spring, the very first butterfly I see every spring is this little small white butterfly with two little orange tips on there. So pay attention, there's lots of fun things to, to look at out there. Now as a gardener, what you need to know, we're all used to planting flowers that we like, and we're used to planting fruits and vegetables that we like. Well, you can, of course, keep doing that, but you can also plant flowers that, that pollinators like. Uh, and birds. So bees, butterflies, birds, you can cater to those in your garden just to make sure that you've got other interesting things to, to look at. So we're going to talk some about plants um, to attract butterflies as nectar plants. We're going to talk about some host plants for butterflies and look at some identification of, of some of the butterflies. First of all, there's some plant families that are very attractive to butterflies and so not everybody's associated with what plants families are in. But you'll see some uh, similarities between some of these things. So a couple of my favorite plant families for butterflies uh, would be, first of all, the sunflower family. So anything that looks like a sunflower or a daisy or a yellow composite flower is generally a good butterfly plant. Also tend to be good bee plants as well. So of course there are annual sunflowers that we all know about. We can easily grow from seed. There are numerous perennial sunflowers uh, like this fall blooming Helianthus gigantuous. There are uh, things like Jerusalem artichoke. There are lots of pass along perennial sunflowers that will give you uh, butterflies and a plant that comes back year after year. Liatris is in the sunflower family, great butterfly plant. So just about anything in that entire family. Of course, we've got a dozen or so species of, of liatris in Texas, uh, all great. And once again, you see with a number of native plants, both a bee plant and a butterfly plant. One thing that uh, often separates bee plants, and we've got 400 plus native bees in, in Texas, maybe even 700, depending on who's counting. And so a lot of the butterfly and, and moth plants, we won't talk about moths today, but essentially the same thing as a butterfly, except they do their work at night and have separate, separate plants to nectar and, and host them. But the difference between a nectar flower for a, a bee and a butterfly and a moth is the, the depth of the throat of that, that flower. So something that has a little short um, throat to get down there to the nectar, certain bees can, can pollinate those. Uh, things that have a long tube generally limit themselves to just butterflies or, or just moths. And some of the things with the longest throats of all are, are just moth pollinated. So butterflies and, and moths have a long proboscis, bees have a little, little short drinking straw. Other perennial uh, sunflower members would be anything in the genus Rebecca. So perennial black eyed Susans, annual black eyed Susans, lots of different ones. That's uh, Rebecca maxima, the swamp coneflower, the giant um, coneflower. Certainly our annual Rebecca, Rebecca herta that you see up and down the roadside, uh, simple to grow, reseeds itself everywhere, a great uh, butterfly plant, and bee plant for that matter. That was a friend in Chirino who had one pop up in his yard, and typical nut like me, and he'd mow around it, let it go to seed, and then he'd seed it out in the little patch, and then he'd let that go to seed, and before long his entire yard was black eyed Susan, so the city of Tyler may not tolerate that, but we country folks do, so. Echinacea, purple coneflower is in the sunflower family. So just about anything that has a daisy ray type flower is in the sunflower family and when you give, will give you butterflies. Now, you have uh, some uh, options when it comes to growing plants for, for butterflies and birds because a lot of the things in the sunflower family are, are great for butter, butterflies for nectar plants. And we're talking about providing you know, sugar water, honey, basically a, a local bar to go drink it. But also a lot of things in that family are great uh, seed for birds. So birds are divided up into fruit eaters and insect eaters and then seed eaters. And so you have the option of leaving these things to go to seed, which of course limits the, the next generation of flowers. If you want more flowers, you can deadhead most of these things in that family and get repeat flowers. If you want birds to dine on the seeds in the summer and fall, you can leave them for seed. So what you might want to do if you like both birds uh, and butterflies is leave some to go to seed, uh, 
keep some sheared to keep them flowering. Also, if you want something to reseed, like echinacea, uh, the wilder forms tend to be pretty prolific reseeders. We can't get reseeders unless you let, unless you leave those seed pods on there to develop and, and ripen, which means, of course, you have to turn kind of brown and ugly. And so don't get too caught up in trying to keep your garden perfect because nature wasn't supposed to be perfect. And so birds didn't evolve with perfect looking plants. Butterflies didn't evolve with perfect looking plants. And so uh, it's okay to, uh, to leave some of those for the, for the birds and also for some to reseed. I love free, free plants in the garden and so I'm always letting some things reseed. Zinnias are in the sunflower family. Uh, one of the easiest uh, annuals to grow from seed. Uh, one of the best garden cut flowers in the entire world. Uh, not tough enough to be a florist cut flower, so uh, that's kind of cool because you can't buy them at the florist. You have to grow them yourself. Now, zinnias, we generally, they're from Mexico, but from a little bit cooler part of Mexico, and so they pretty much you do a spring crop, you plant about April, they go until about midsummer, and then they look like heck, and then you can either save some seed, cut them down, uh, start with another crop about July, August, and bloom those into the fall. So really best to seed uh, two crops each year, but great butterfly plants. And might as well test you already. Anybody recognize that butterfly? Gulf Friddler. We'll, we'll get to those here in a minute. So it's little orange butterflies can be confusing just like black swallowtails can be confusing. Confusing. I'm not gonna kick you out of the class like I did my master gardeners for giving the wrong answers. <laughs> until you get to the third one. The verbena family. Actually, the verbena, verbena family is probably the number one butterfly family for attracting uh, butterflies to, to nectar on. Now, the problem is, uh, true verbenas, first of all, if you're into botany, they've changed the genus for verbenas to glandularia. And so any of the ones that didn't look like a verbena, the vervain still stayed in the verbena genus. The things that look like a verbena are no longer verbena, so it's very confusing. So I'm not switching. A verbena is a verbena. But just realize that verbenas are really showy and pretty, but they like cool weather. They don't like the heat of summer. And so the best way to think of verbenas is a cool season lantana, which they're related to. So verbenas like mild winters. They like springtime. Uh, they like fall, but they don't like summer. Come in lots of different colors. A lot of them that they sell around the world are pretty much annuals for us here because they don't survive the summer, but still great to butterfly plants in the springtime. And then there are other species of verbena, like verbena bonariensis, sometimes called the, the candy stick verbena. It's a great uh, butterfly plant. There's a, it's from South America. Uh, one of its cousins, verbena brasiliensis, has little tiny flowers and is actually a weed up down the roadside in the pastures. Even though it has tiny little flowers, it's in that same family and also a great butterfly plant. So when you're driving down the road, uh, look and you'll see butterflies uh, nectar on the, the little bitty version of this. All right, you might want to guess that butterfly while we're testing you. Tiger swallowtail, good job. And then lantana, and we have a lot more warm weather in, in East Texas than we do cool weather, so uh, we get a lot more season of color out of lantanas than we do verbena. So if you think of lantana as a hot season verbena, and verbena is a cool season lantana, that'll help you remember. They're close, they're in the same family, they both attract butterflies, but one likes it hot and one likes it cool. And so if you can only plant one plant, to attract butterflies, you're gonna have one pot or one bed or space for one plant. Lantana is probably your best choice because you're gonna get April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. You're gonna have a few months out of the winter time that, that freezes down. You could also you could put a few spring bulbs in there if you wanted to, and that would give you butterflies all summer long. I've done some uh, lantana trials on my life with 30 and 40 different lantanas at a time, and you have to have a fly swatter to get through there just because of the butterflies, and so just amazing. Uh, how many different butterflies you'll attract. So butterflies are not very particular about what they nectar on. A little bit picky, but it's kind of like an alcoholic and alcohol. So they may have their favorite, but if it comes down to it, they'll, they'll drink anything. <laughs> Host plants are very different, so we're going to talk about it in a minute. And so for attracting butterflies to look at, uh, certain kinds of flowers in the sunflower and verbena family will get you all kinds of butterflies that you'll have fun identifying. And of course, lantana comes in bush types, it comes in trailing type, and it comes in the in-between types, like a, a, like a to the new gold lantana. And so this is lantana montevidensis, the trailing type, which comes in white and lavender. And of course, the semi-trailing types, like um, new gold and silver bound, are in-between, and then the bush types are usually taller, but, but not always. General rule is the bush types are more cold-hardy, the trailing types are, are less cold-hardy, but all of them extremely attractive to butterflies. Vitex is in the verbena family, 
And so Vitex, um, most of you know, but it's a relative of verbena and lantana and also butterfly bush. So butterfly bush is historically like a little bit cooler. So you tend to see butterfly bushes or budlia more in the cooler parts of Europe and Vitex more in the hot parts of, of Europe. And so it comes in white and pink and blue and purple, but normally what you see is the blue or purple, but um, also uh, very attractive to, to bees as well as butterflies. And so there's a zebra swallowtail and a pink vitex, also called chase tree, or sometimes called Texas lilacs. Now, most butterfly bushes are not super long-lived in the south. Uh, you tend to see them more in the north and Europe and even some parts of the world, like in France, they naturalize on the train tracks and the cracks of the sidewalks. So they're a little more um, appealing to cooler climates, but there are some uh, supremely adapted here. So there's an old-timey species, it's not the most attractive, called Budlia lindiana from China. It has these long little drooping flowers. It not only comes back here, it multiplies and sprouts everywhere. And so my grandmother had it in her yard and it gets passed around a good bit. And the cool thing is there's some uh, really good plant breeders at uh, North Carolina State. And one of those guys that breeds Budlia has started using this easy, easy, almost too easy to grow Budlia to cross with some of the shorter Budlias and coming up with some things in, in between. Uh, and so if you've got any genetics of Budlia Lindleyana in you, uh, you're gonna be more adapted to the south. Now, no more on the verbena family, but a few other plants that are good attractors for butterflies would be pintas. And if you get on Jeopardy, pintas is always spelled with an S, so there's no such thing as a pinta. So you can have one pintas or 10 pintas. Um, my students used to always get confused about that. And so good, uh, good butterfly plant, come in a multitude of colors, uh, long-term summer color for us. Pintas, or Egyptian star cluster, another name for it. Phlox are great butterfly plants. Now, when I was a kid and I heard, I was interested in gardening and I'd hear people talking about phlox and I'm thinking, F-L-O-C-K-S, must be a whole bunch of them. So P-H-L-O-X, phlox. I learned that by getting embarrassed early on. There are perennial flocks, there are annual flocks, there are upright flocks, there are trailing flocks. They're all good butterfly plants. They're pretty good moth plants as well. Uh, tend to be good cut flowers, tend to be fragrant as well. And so that's one of the upright perennial flocks, garden flocks, standing flocks, flocks paniculata, and that's one called Victoria. And so there's a giant bannock flock. So it doesn't matter what kind of flocks you plant, if it's blooming, you're gonna get butterflies. Now be careful because Phlox paniculata, what we call garden phlox or standing phlox, is native to the southeastern United States. European settlers got here, saw how pretty it was. It was just magenta, hot pink in its wild form. Took it back to Europe, so over the last 100 years, they developed all colors, variegated leaves, orange flowers, red flowers, double flowers, pink flowers, white flowers. Most of them won't grow in Georgia and South Carolina where they started uh, their life from because they spent so long being developed in a a climate that had cold winters and mild summers. And so there aren't that many of the multitude of garden flocks. If you pick up a catalog and see all those pretty ones in there, most of them don't grow here. The ones that grow best here are the old magenta pink ones that you see in somebody's grandmother's yard and their grandmother's yard and then people swap and trade around. And uh, unfortunately, magenta was the color that uh, garden writers years ago bashed as this horrible color that wouldn't go with anything. It goes all the way back to some chemical in, in Europe that was that color that everybody just had a disdain for. Unfortunately, that's the color phlox is supposed to be, so certainly nothing wrong with, the, with magenta flowers. Uh, John Vanek is actually one of the few that's not magenta, so nothing wrong with starting with a, any, well, one thing I learned from doing phlox trials is magenta phlox next to a dead phlox is a really pretty color. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't worry about what color it is, because they're all gonna get butterflies, but it's gotta live to attract a butterfly. And we have native phlox here. This is phlox pilosa that grows on the roadsides in, in East Texas. We've got, of course, Louisiana phlox uh, from the woodlands headed east. We've got uh, uh, annual phlox drummondii that you'll see in, in Central Texas. And uh, in Central Texas, it's red. In East Texas, when you see a drummond's phlox, it'll be all colors of white and pink and, and bicolors. And so it's a sandy, loving annual perennial uh, phlox pilosa. The prairie phlox will grow in. in assorted types of soils. But once again, all good butterfly plants. Now let's talk a little bit about host plants. So, so far, everything I've talked about has been a nectar plant. General flowers that attract butterflies to come sip uh, sugar water out of the flower. I'm part hummingbird, so I understand the allure of having sweets that are free 
And so if somebody's going to put up cake, candy, cokes, and cookies, I'm going to be there lining up with the butterflies too. And so they're pretty, uh, they're not very discriminant about nectar plants. But every butterfly, uh, of course everybody knows the story of butterflies from childhood, comes from a caterpillar. And those caterpillars are very, very picky and specific about what they eat. And so a certain type of butterfly may host on 10 or 15 kind of flowers, may nectar on 10 or 15 kind of flowers. The caterpillar, the larval stage of that butterfly, may host on a single species or a single genus. And so if you're really into butterflies, now not everybody has the option of planting host plants in their landscape. Because of course, when you have a host plant, you're it's a plant that the caterpillar is going to come along and eat. And so you can always tell the butterfly people from the non-butterfly people when they come in and they're either going to say, you got to come see my passion vine. It's got gulf fritillary larva all over it. And then somebody else will come in and say, I need some insecticide because there are worms eating my passion vine. <laughs> and so realize it's, a, it's not necessarily for everybody's garden, although it, it's a good idea to you can, you can share. But if you have any place in the country, if you have vacant lots, if you have rural property, you have a lake house, and there are plenty of places that you can grow uh, host plants without having a, a plant that's eaten by caterpillars in your front bed. So let's start off by talking about uh, Asclepias or butterfly weed. And so I bet most of you know what butterfly hosts on uh, butterfly weed. The monarch. And most of you hopefully know that the monarch is the Texas state insect. And most of you that are gardeners probably know that monarchs are, are having trouble. And so they're, uh, they're an odd duck for a butterfly because monarchs are the only butterfly that I know of that's migratory. I say that. Uh, with, uh, can of leaf rollers is a little skipper butterfly. It works its way up through the country uh, generation after generation following canna plantings. And so monarchs do that with Asclepius, the genus Asclepius, and we'll look at a few different ones. So that's uh, any milkweed, and that's all they'll lay their eggs on. It has to be in that genus. Nothing else in that family, nothing else on the planet, only the genus Asclepius. And so they lay their eggs, they raise, adult, flies a few more states up, lays an egg, so they work their way up in multiple generations. But at the end of the year, that last butterfly out there has to fly all the way back to Mexico. It doesn't have the option of laying eggs and raising more kids. That butterfly has to fly all the way either to summon, <coughs> spend the winter in California, most of them in the forest in Mexico. And so that gives it multiple problems. It's got to have Asclepius. In the old days, we had lots of open land and open prairie. Uh, unfortunately, we're dealing with about 1% of the prairies left in the United States. Most of East Texas is, of course, either cow pastures or, or pine forests, so we just don't have a lot of, of what we consider weeds, of which a butterfly would consider like McDonald's every square foot. And so it's got to have Asclepius, and then it's got to have flowers to nectar on, so you're not just, you know, the kid will eat the, the foliage, but the adult has to have, have nectar, and so it's got to have gasoline and fuel. So that means you got to have flowers all the way up through the country. And then the tough part, it turns out, everybody's been kind of freaking out about, you know, not enough Asclepius, and don't think that's the bigger problem. The bigger problem is coming back you have to have flowers. Well, how many people have flowers in a field of ripening wheat or a cow pasture or a pine forest? And so it turns out they're a huge problem with its nectar source to fuel its trip all the way back to Mexico. And so we need a lot more fall flowers. And so most of you that have flowers in the fall uh, we'll see monarchs uh, nectar on those flowers because they have to have them. No way they can fly back to Mexico on an empty stomach. And then you've got some huge issues with these uh, conifer forests in Mexico. You know, you're chopping down the forest, but for some reason this odd butterfly just gathers in mass and hangs on these branches of these particular trees in a particular forest. And so Asclepius is not as big an issue as the flowers, and the flower is probably not as big an issue even as where it needs to spend its, its winter time. So we've got some issues. Now that's not a, not a monarch, that's a zebra swallowtail. So once again, a number of different butterflies will nectar on a plant. But in this particular case, only one kind of butterfly hosts on that plant. And so there's our, our monarch butterfly. So monarchs, monarchs are orange, and they've got the typical black stripes, and they've got some, some white spots on there. Uh, but easy to confuse for the beginners with all the other orange butterflies. And so orange is a fairly common color in butterflies. Not as common as what other color? Yellow. Yellow. Apparently the origin of the original name butterfly was the fact that it was the color of butter and flying around, so that's where they get butterflies from. Now I have to say, Dr. Parsons 
always took, he was one of my mentors, always took these beautiful butterfly pictures and everybody would always say, oh my gosh, how did you get that picture? I can never get that butterfly to be still. And uh, I hate to tell you, but he would give them what he called an attitude adjustment and then place them on the flower and then take his picture. And it was the first time I ever learned this, that butterflies only live for two or three weeks, most of them not even that long. He would always say, it was going to die tomorrow anyway. And so, I didn't kill it. It's just, and so, and I busted him because I'm like, I've never seen that butterfly on this flower or that flower. He, he'd always put them on the, he wasn't a flower guy, so he'd place them on the wrong flower. And say, I've never seen a monarch on a Nacogdoches rose before. The poor butterfly didn't have a choice. He's just like clinging to life there. Anyway, so if you go to the Jerry Parsons of plantanswers.com, look at all those beautiful butterfly pictures. Look real close and see what flowers are on. And look real close in their eyes and see if they're not dazed. And like, Ugh. All right, as gardeners, Mostly, um, we know the, the Asclepias curasalica, the, uh, what's called the tropical butterfly weed. And so it's sold at nurseries, it's easy to grow. Uh, marginally perennial here, depending on the winter, recedes a little bit, comes in a gold flower form and then the uh, orange and yellow form. And so it's the easiest one to grow uh, to raise your own little baby monarchs. There are some issues when you get down in the uh, southern part of Texas, uh, about the plants being perennial and having some issues with disease for the butterflies, but not a problem here because they freeze down every year. So easy to grow if you want to uh, try to raise your own monarchs passing through. We certainly have native Asclepias here, so Asclepias tuberosa is one of our most beautiful perennial wildflowers. Unfortunately, uh, you don't see it much anymore because it doesn't grow in cow pastures or, or pine forests. So generally in sandy soils, you'll see some on, on the roadside. And uh, I cringed last year when I drove through Rust County when they decided to spray their entire roadsides with Roundup and some of my favorite patches of butterfly weed get sprayed with, with Roundup. So a great bee pollinated plant, but also a decent nectar plant. Uh, but because it's in the genus Asclepius, it's a host plant uh, for monarch butterflies. Now, unfortunately, it's not the best host plant. Uh, so the choice one doesn't do the best job of raising larvae. But the best one that we have is our, our green milkweed, Asclepius um, uh, aspera. And so it's, uh, most people don't even pay attention to it. If you're driving down the roadside uh, and you look out on the pasture or you look along the roadside, you just see this light green sort of color on some thick leaf plants. If you get close to it, of course, you can see the lavender there in the middle of the flowers. Most of the genus Asclepius is a, if I remember from school, is a bee pollinated plant. So it's got these little slits inside the, uh, the flower parts in there and the anthers look like a little wishbone or a, a pulley bone. So the bee's in there sipping some nectar, snags this little uh, pulley bone on its hind leg and then carries it to the, to the next flower. And so it's amazing that you got a plant that's actually bee pollinated, but yet is a host plant uh, for a single uh, species of the butterfly. And of course the, the butterflies fly around, and it's pretty amazing if you watch butterflies, they're, one, they're flying around looking for nectar to drink, but also are flying around looking for host plants to lay their eggs on. And so they can't smell like we do, so they smell with their tongue. So they literally have to go around tasting, smelling every plant to find their host plant. So imagine all the plants out there that you can only lay your eggs on that one particular species. And so that's what a monarch has to do. And so there's what the larva of a monarch butterfly looks like. Striped little fellows with black and white and, and yellow. And so that's on the, the tropical milkweed. Here's one up close. And so caterpillars can be all different colors and all different shapes and some are showy and some are ugly and some are scary looking. Uh, some have their backside that looks like the head, the front side that looks like the, the backside. And, uh, some of them change colors as they go through uh, the different molting stages, but they have to eat their plant and they have to eat a lot of it. And so they start as a little bitty, of course, tiny a caterpillar, and then they munch, 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 and then they turn into a chrysalis, and then they spend a certain period of time in that stage, and then, of course, come out a butterfly. So amazing thing for, for kids to watch, but just realize that they, they have to eat. So just like a cow or a chicken or a pet or a kid, uh, they got to have their food, too. Now, there are two other butterflies that are often confused. Well, we've already confused one, the Gulf Fritillary, which is orange, but two that look even more uh, like a a monarch butterfly. One is the queen butterfly. It's a little bit smaller. Um, you have all this stuff called mimicry in the butterfly world. So sometimes there'll be a butterfly that's it's toxic to a bird and other butterflies that evolved to be look like that so the birds wouldn't eat them either. 
And so the difference with the queen, in addition to being a little bit smaller, the spots are scattered across the wing, where they're not scattered on the wings of the, the monarch. They're just on the, on the black borders there. So that's a queen butterfly. One year we had a whole bunch of queen butterflies in the Heritage Rose Garden on the Asclepius, on the tropical milkweed. So of course everybody thought they were monarchs, but they weren't. And so there were you know, 10 or 15 at a time fluttered around on, on the plants. And, and so they, uh, if I remember right, they actually host on the Asclepius as well. And then this is the Viceroy, which of course looks like a, a monarch as well. Uh, a little bit smaller, so it's almost the uh, almost the same thing, but smaller. But notice on the the lower wings there, it has that black line running through there. A monarch doesn't have that, and so I don't know if this pointer works. And so that little line right there <coughs> and right there, well, monarchs don't have. So it's about half the size of a monarch and has that black line running through there, and host on something entirely different: willow trees. And so, not even a herbaceous plant. So even though it looks like a monarch, uh, the rest of its life cycle is nothing like a monarch. And so you think of willow trees, you think of farmers and ranchers and people cursing willows, popping up all on the edge of their pond, and fishermen wanting to cut them down because they can't get their pole in the water. So one thing you learn when it comes to butterflies is every plant out there that's native is a host for something else. And so it doesn't matter if you have a use for it, uh, nature does. Of course, the orange butterfly that we saw a little bit early, earlier is the Gulf Fridlery butterfly. Very common, one of our most common butterflies in East Texas. Uh, it's smaller than a monarch, doesn't have those uh, uh, black borders, uh, doesn't have the, uh, the white spots on the border. Of course, doesn't have the lines running through it. If you'll notice, its wings are long and, and spread out, and so there are several uh, tropical butterflies in a group called the long wing group that literally stretched out elongated and really fun from a uh, evolutionary standpoint because if you go back far enough and uh, we hear a lot about climate change but we've had radical climate change in the past and so there have been times when we were underneath the ocean here there have been times when we were hot and dry here there have been times when we were tropical here well when our tropical period was here we've got remnants left over from that so things like palmettos uh, or dwarf palmetto our state stone, which is petrified palm that was left over from our tropical days. Pawpaws that we'll talk about later. Hymena callus. Well, passion vines, uh, the whole genus Passiflora is a tropical species. So all its relatives are down there in the tropics. If you ever had passion fruit or tropical punch with, with passion fruit in there, it's, it's popular in the, in the tropics. So this butterfly and all its relatives are, are tropical. So it's the only one of the, its family that got left up here in a non-tropical area. And there's just a few of those tropical passion vines that got left up here and, and learned to be cold hardy. And so it's a remnant of our old tropical days. And so you can have Gulf Fritillary if you don't have passion vines. So its larva will only eat things in the genus Passiflora. So if you're not a passion vine, it's not eating. So it, it won't eat grass, it won't eat um, milkweed, it won't eat willow trees, and so it has to have passion vine. And here's an example of our native Passiflora incarnata, which once again is bee pollinated, <coughs> native bee pollinated, and so there you are with a carpenter bee uh, pollinating uh, a passion vine. And let me tell you something, if you've got children or grandchildren or a school garden, the best thing you can plant is a passion vine, because you've got about eight months of a PBS special going on right there in front of you. <laughs> And so, first of all, you get to talk about the whole history of the country and the tropical plants and when we were hot, when we were dry, when we were cold, when we were in the, in the ocean. And just look at this amazing flower and you can see why they, uh, they actually, the Spanish settlers got here and attributed all parts of it to the, the Passion of Christ. That's where they got the name Passion Vine. But if you look, that uh, to get to the nectar, uh, that bee has to shove himself under the anther there, which brush, brushes the pollen on his back there. And so... Uh, it's tricking him, and, and that's what flowers do. So, here, I'll give you something free to drink, and then they're dumping or hooking their, uh, just like plants do with, with seed and, and fruit, they do the same thing with pollen. And so that bee is not after the pollen, he's after the nectar, but it's the plant that the butterfly needs. Now, we have two species of Passiflora in East Texas that are native. You've got Passiflora incarnata, and this little one that most people don't pay attention to, Passiflora lutea, and the Passiflora lutea I always thought it was cool as a kid because sometimes you'd see it grow up the trunks of trees and the little uh, tiny passion fruits, not much bigger than a, than a English pea, 
and it goes from green to, to black. And for some reason, I thought they were olives. And so, oh, cool, because I didn't know a thing about plants except that I liked them. And so there was green olives and black olives on there. Well, it turns out it's a passion vine. If you notice, the flower is the exact same uh, kind of flower. There are many different kind of uh, passion vine species in the tropics, but only two here in any animal work as the um, host plant. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of foliage on Passiflora lutea, so a smart butterfly is going to find it a, a much more vigorous species to, to lay its eggs on. And yellow is pretty rare in the Passiflora world, so even though it's small and not that dark yellow, it's, it's kind of special because yellow is an uncommon color. Most passion vines tend to be purple and lavender. And then here's what a, the larva of a golf fiddler looks like. Now, here's the uh, the cool thing about it, of course, a non-gardener is always going to say, oh my gosh, is this going to kill my plant? No. So these things evolve together over thousands, if not millions of years. If it kills the plant, the larva dies, the butterfly dies, and goes extinct. So it's never going to kill it. So, I mean, you may kill it, but the butterfly is not because it knows how to deal with it. And let me talk about some of the ways that it deals with it here. At the base of every leaf, find a good example here. There's two little nectar glands on there. So we're familiar with nectar glands inside the flower. Well, this plant threw some extra ones on there to attract ants. And so ants will go and suck the nectar out of those glands. Of course, there's not enough for the ant, and the ant decides it'll just pick off whole caterpillars. So it's the plants literally attracting ants uh, to catch the caterpillars. Of course, birds are attracted to the caterpillars. Every baby bird that I can think of, uh, pretty much all of them, feed caterpillars to the babies and other soft insects. So of course, birds pick them off. The, uh, a lot of times, there will be assassin bugs on there. And so a little orange uh, and black insect with a, a little spear for a, uh, a mouth part. And so it would literally stab little caterpillars. You'll see them walking around, you know, carrying their little kill around with them. So you got all this stuff going on there. You got birds, you got bees. I've watched uh, Eastern Phoebe's, you know, picking off the butterflies. And you look up there and you see a, a little bird with an orange bow tie on it, and you realize it's a, a bird holding a, an orange butterfly in his mouth. So you got the birds, you got the, the bees, you got the uh, ants on there. And then the plant, if you've ever grown passion vine before, you know it suckers profusely. And so it's constantly trying to run away from where the, uh, the caterpillars are. So it's learned to like, well, I'm not gonna stay here, they're eating me here, so I'm gonna come up here and come up here. So it's always running. And then you've got the, uh, the caterpillars, uh, once they decide to make a chrysalis, and so there's a chrysalid. One is a chrysalid, two would be chrysalis. And so it makes a, a chrysalis that looks like a dead leaf on the plant. So occasionally you'll see a curled up leaf on the plant and the chrysalis, and they almost look just the same. But the caterpillar is smart enough that it doesn't put them on the plant, it goes, on your wall, your fence, the eaves of your house. Here's an old dinner bell that I have. So it tries to get as far away from the plant as it can because that's where everybody's coming to eat because you got all those caterpillars on there. So it tries to get someplace where nobody's going to pick it off and it's going to try to disguise itself as a dead leaf. So lots of fun stuff uh, for kids and just shows you how amazing nature is. And so there's an up close look at a uh, Gulf Fritillary uh, chrysalid. And they will actually move. And so if you, uh, if you tap on one of these little guys, you think it's this rigid, hard little structure. It's not. It'll like uh, twist and shout when you give it a little thump there. And then some of these chrysalids and all the different butterflies will actually make it through the winter time and then not emerge to the fall and winter. Of course, you know, they all have to some way to make it season to season, so we don't have butterflies during the winter time. So I've been watching a couple of these chrysalids next to my uh, chicken yard gate to see when they'll emerge. All right, let's look at some swallowtail butterflies. Swallowtails, and I have to admit, we're all guilty of this. Uh, as gardeners, we learn the pretty flowers. As butterfly people, we learn the pretty butterflies. As bird people, we learn the pretty birds. And so my challenge to you is, yes, start with the pretty ones, because that's the ones that you want to know, but learn the rest of them, because there were hundreds and hundreds more, and they're all equally in, important. And so it's not really fair that we just look and learn the, the pretty ones' names. And so even if you don't learn their names, know that they're important and they're tied to nature. And so what's so special about the, the one, they're all special, but the giant swallowtail, hence the name, is our biggest, largest swallowtail butterfly that we have. And it's a little bit uh, unique because when it's, a lot of butterflies will look the same with the wings up or down, and some of them look entirely different. So when the wings are up, they look one color, and when they're down, they look another color. And so uh, 
Giant swallowtails have mostly yellow on the underside of their wings, and they're mostly black with some of my butterfly friends call a big yellow smile on the top of their wings. And so if you look for a, a black and yellow swallowtail, there are other black ones that are confusing, but they don't have as much yellow on And big, the largest of our, our, all of our butterflies, and that's going to be a giant swallowtail butterfly. So most people know it. Most people have seen it. It's a pretty common butterfly here. But what most people don't realize is what it hosts on. And so if you're a giant swallowtail, the larva, which by the way look like bird poop, which a number of butterflies do. So if you don't want to be eaten, you can look like a dead leaf. You can look like something scary. You can put eyes on the back side so they don't pluck off your head. Or you can look like something that they're guaranteed not to eat. So a number of butterflies have larvae that literally looks like something a bird pooped out on a leaf. And so uh, be looking for that. But in this case, it only hosts on things in the citrus family. Nothing else in the world. Now, of course, we all know citrus and lemons and limes and all that stuff. A lot of tropical members of that family. Well, not very many um, citrus family members in East Texas. Only two. And only one of them is common. So if you live out in the country, if you've ever built a fence or run around with cows and that sort of thing, we have something called a Hercules club or, or tickle tongue or toothache tree. It's a kind of a spiny tree. It makes big spines on the trunk. You would never in a million years climb the trunk of a Hercules club because it has these big lumps on it tipped with a, with a spine on there. In the old days, it was important because you could literally make your own ambusol out of the leaves or the bark of this tree. So if you chew on it, it gives you a minty numbing sensation. So if you've got a sore tooth, if you've got a canker sore on your lip, uh, it's a certainly, certainly edible. But for that butterfly, that's it. That's our only common citrus family member, the Tickle Tongue or Hercules Club. It makes little bitty fruit. I know it's hard to envision, but that little fruit is the equivalent of an orange or a lemon or a lime or a grapefruit. And so similar, uh, similar uh, resins and stuff. Of course, if you've ever crushed a, a lemon rind or an orange rind or a citrus leaf, it's chock full of resins, just like this plant is. And then there's one other family member that's not very common, so my mom might be the only one in here that's ever paid attention to one. So this is the uh, uh, hop tree or a wafer ash. So it's the only other member of the citrus family, not so common. Uh, you see it some in Central Texas, you'll see it scattered around in East Texas. And so that butterfly will lay its eggs on one of those two plants here. And you have to realize for that butterfly to be as common as it is, that means there has to be a whole bunch of those. And so when you see people demanding that their fence rows are perfectly clean or they want that spiny tree you know, out of the yard or pasture, uh, it's the reason we have the giant swallowtail butterfly. And there's why they call uh, that particular tree uh, wafer ash, because it makes those uh, flat looking seeds that of course look nothing like a lemon lime or, or an orange. And of course you can have citrus. Now the citrus growers can't stand uh, giant swallowtails because they lay eggs on the citrus and they, they munch on the, on the foliage, but you can uh, raise those same butterflies. Now we don't do a lot of citrus here without keeping them in a greenhouse or dragging the pots in during the winter, but they will certainly eat citrus as well. The only things in that family. All right, let's move on to the, to the black swallowtails. They're confusing. And so the, one of the most common, and the first one to start with, is the eastern black swallowtail. And so there are a lot of people that get into butterflies and just look at any swallowtail and say, it's a black swallowtail. Well, realize that there's one true eastern black swallowtail, and there are other swallowtails that are black. They're not called black swallowtails. So realize there's some differences in there. The eastern black swallowtail only hosts on things in the carrot family. And so you have to be related to a carrot, so that means you can be a carrot, or Queen Anne's lace, or bishop weed, or parsley, or dill, or fennel. So if you've ever grown uh, dill and fennel in your garden, you've probably seen uh, these caterpillars show up because the butterflies fly around, they look, they sniff, they taste, they lay their eggs, and they have a, a pretty looking uh, larval stage as well. And so I like the plant enough that you can have some left over without having to pick them off or, or kill them. So fennel, which I've never found a way to eat fennel, but certainly a good host for, for the eastern black swallowtail. Dill, my mom was a pickle maker, so we always grew dill, and so you can certainly get uh, eastern black swallowtail larva on dill. Luckily, one year, I watched her lay her eggs, I watched the, leg, the eggs hatch, I watched it form a, a eat on the plant, then make a, a chrysalis, and then I literally watched it open up, look at it, put its little silk strings on there to tie it to keep it from falling off, and then it starts to emerge. And then it crawls out of there, because 
they don't look like much when they come out, so they literally got to pump some blood into their, their wings, so they just crinkle little ugly things when they come out, and they sit there a while and start to expand, and before long, you got an eastern black swallowtail. So that's, every butterfly goes through a similar thing based on a different plant, uh, based on a, a different chrysalid, so that's the way it, the way it works. Now, some of the confusing black swallowtails. The two that are most common are going to be the pipe vine swallowtail, and I'll teach you two ways to, to learn it. Now, much easier with a picture, and as we know, butterflies don't tend to just sit still and, and pose. And when you're trying to look at the top of the wings, they're showing you the underside of the wings, and so a little bit difficult. But the, the pipe vine swallowtail has this iridescent blue on the lower wing. And so the way I like to remember it, it looks like blue smoke on there. And so think of it as a blue, hazy smoke that's blown across the lower uh, portion of the wing there. Now, the uh, pipe vine swallowtail hosts on one genus in the world. It's got to be in the genus Aristolochia, or pipe vines. We only have about one that's native. We have a number that are cultivated. Some make, they all make this little bitty Dutchman pipe, pipe kind of flower. Mostly we grow this little species from Argentina, which is a ground cover. In the old days, people grew the, the great big one on trellises in their garden that made literally something <coughs> larger than an Englishman's pipe. And so, very intricate looking flowers, but it's what you have to have for a pipe by swallowtail. So here's some at Keith Hansen's house, and look at those, they look like menacing caterpillars, and any big non-gardener is gonna say, don't touch that, it's gonna sting you, it's gonna bite. No, it's not. And so they just, they try to look scary, so a bird won't eat them. Uh, and of course, they're there to eat that foliage, and then they'll march off, make their little chrysalis, so they're black and with orange spots and spines on there. And then, one that looks similar, is the spice bush swallowtail. And notice it has its same blue kind of cloud across, across the lower portion of the wing, but it's more of a baby blue, like you sprinkle blue powder on there. And so I like to think of the pipe vine as this iridescent blue smoke, and the spice bush, like you sprinkled blue powdered sugar on there. So it's, it's a lighter blue, and it's a little creamier look to it. Now, there's a better way to tell them apart. Let's see if I have it on here. Yeah. And so when they raise their wings up, the tops look similar, just two different shades of blue, one's iridescent, one's kind of powdery. But when they raise their wings up, the pipe vine swallowtail has one row of orange spots under there. And then the spice bush swallowtail has two rows of orange spots. So my uh, lepidopterist friends years ago that were teaching me butterflies said, remember it, that you can only smoke one pipe at a time, but you can sprinkle two spices at a time. And so you can have a spice in each hand, so two for the spice bush, one for the pipe vine. Otherwise, they're, they're pretty darn similar, but host on entirely different plants. And so this host on a native shrub called spice bush, which, which is not that, not that common, I think can also host on, on uh, sassafras as well. There's a bad disease that's coming to the East Coast uh, that's spreading around on laurels and uh, red bay and uh, sassafras and spice bush and uh, People are kind of concerned about it over there. Well, if you don't have those plants, you don't have, there's about three butterflies that use those plants. And uh, I guarantee they'll get excited about it when it eventually gets uh, over this direction because uh, it also will kill an avocado tree. And so when you have these crazy diseases or insects that, that come in, not only people don't pay attention until it gets on some economic crop, but by then it's often too late. Okay, uh, a butterfly that's not black, but black and yellow striped, uh, is the tiger swallowtail, the eastern tiger swallowtail. It was the first butterfly painted in, in North America. So it's pretty enough that somebody pulled out their paint and said, I'm going to paint this one. And it's uh, got typical tiger stripes on there. It'll uh, nectar on a lot of different plants. It will, I have a picture. It hosts on a number of different trees, including ash trees and black cherry and some other woodland trees. Uh, it's funny I mentioned ash tree because there's a bad insect that got introduced from China called the emerald ash borer into the non-gardener, the non-butterfly person. You think, well, who cares if we have an ash tree? Well, first of all, that's what they make baseball bats out of. And it's also one, the main host plant for our prettiest, one of our prettiest, my second favorite butterfly, the tiger swallowtail butterfly. Now, it does something interesting. Occasionally, the females of the tiger swallowtail will not be black and yellow striped. They'll be all black and will look just like uh, a pipe vine swallowtail or a spice bush swallowtail. 
but they don't have the, the rows of spots like they do. But when you look and see where the sunlight shines them, you can still see the tiger stripes in there. So they're never dark enough black that it hides its stripes. And so when you see one of those, it's still a eastern tiger swallowtail. And for some reason, it's sex linked, and so it's always a, a female. And so that's the black form uh, of a female tiger swallowtail. And on a verbena. And as I mentioned, uh, one of our main host plants for it are ash trees. Now, I know my friends and my master gardeners get sick of me talking about my favorite butterfly. And so the zebra swallowtail is an interesting butterfly. It stripes like a, a tiger swallowtail, except they're black and white like a zebra. It's also in a, a tropical family of butterflies that host on a tropical family of plants. So it's also a remnant left over from the tropical days. And interesting, it's, uh, it starts off as a woodland butterfly, uh, and I'll show pictures of pawpaws here, here in a minute. And so they host on a plant that grows in creek bottoms. And the first generation of them is smaller and greenish white with short tails. And each generation moves upland and gets larger and the tails get longer. So they're little at the beginning of the year uh, in a bottomland forest tree. And by the end of the year, they have uh, long tails and they're black and white and larger. And so it's in this uh, group called the tail. So it has a, instead of being elongated, sort of a big uh, uh, triangle shape. And there are other, many other relatives of it in the tropics, but it's the only one here. And you can see how long those tails are on some Henry Dilbert salvia. And uh, why would you want to have great big long tails if you're a butterfly? Yeah, so if a bird's grabbing you, they snap, you can certainly lose a little tail that they're not hurting anything. It's the same reason they make eye spots down there, too. So they want somebody to snip off the backside there, you know, the lower portion of the wing and the, and the swallowtail, and you can still fly and do your work. So just an exquisite looking butterfly with the blue spots and the red stripes and the black and white. So, and I always make it a point every year to notice the first tiger swallowtails that come out. They usually come out when the narcissus are blooming, and I've got a few lilacs that bloom. They'll show up on those. And then the zebra swallowtails usually show up uh, in the woods. So when I'm doing my control burns during spring break, that's usually when I see my first ones flitting around in the woods. And it's the hardest butterfly to take a picture of because they don't sit still. Uh, they hardly ever just sit there and pose. So you usually have to find one that's just come out of a chrysalis and is laying there waiting to, to fly, or you just have to take 100 pictures and help one of them comes out because they're the flittiest thing you'll, you'll run across. But uh, and there you see it, nectared on the Asclepius, as we saw before. Last year while I was mowing, I had never paid attention in my life, being a lifelong mower of lawns and worked at the turf lab at A&M and the turf lab at LSU and grew up with clover and my dad likes Dutch clover in his pastures. Well, I've always associated Dutch clover with being a, a bee plant, particularly a honeybee plant. Dutch clover is from Europe, honeybees are from Europe. Well, I was amazed last year while I'm mowing my lawn, how many butterflies were on the, the Dutch clover. So not only a, a good bee plant, but a butterfly plant as well. And so of course I had to mow around the zebra swallowtail because didn't want to chop him up. Now, most butterflies would do something called puddling. And so not only do they need nectar, they also need minerals and, and nutrients. And so you'll see them on sand, you'll see them on brick, you'll see them on rocks, particularly after rains. So they're literally uh, licking up, you know how minerals will collect on uh, bricks and uh, clay pots and that sort of thing. Well, they literally go down there like a salt flat. And so you can see most kinds of butterflies. And you can even create a little, like a salt lake for your cows or your, or your deer. You can do that same thing for, for butterflies because they need that as well. And then the pawpaw tree is an odd tree found more in the southeastern United States, but also all the way up to about Michigan. And so it's a remnant of a tropical fruit family, the only one that, that grows in the tropical, I mean in the temperate zone. And just an odd understory tree with funny looking maroon fruit and funny little shaped fruit that make a sicky sweet tropical fruit. So it's just amazing to think that it and its butterfly are left over from a whole different part of the world, uh, but they learned to manage to grow here. Sometimes we call it the Michigan banana for some of you that moved down from Michigan or Indiana where it goes all the way up there. And there's me actually watching one lay eggs. So this poor little thing was desperate, but it was like determined to lay right there even though it was uh, bothering it. So. And there's what a little baby uh, zebra swallowtail looks like. And so uh, all caterpillars are different, but this guy literally has a swollen head on him and always looks a little odd. And that can be a brown and white or, or green and white. So there he is getting a little bit larger. And so I'm sure he wants some privacy, but I didn't give it to him. <laughs> a 
few other butterflies. This is the American Painted Lady butterfly. So Painted Lady, American Painted Lady look very similar. Um, and see those little eye spots on there? It doesn't have any tails to be snipped off, but it does put its eyes back there. And so the, really the only difference you, that you can discern between those two is the uh, American Painted Lady has four of those eye spots and the Painted Lady has two of those eye spots. That's it on a bud lip. Pretty common butterfly. If you've got zinnias during the summertime, you'll see them. Now, believe it or not, the, the main host plant we have for that is a common weed on the sidewalk, vacant lots, uh, part of your yard where you can't grow grass. We call cut weed or, or rabbit tobacco. And so it has to be related to that uh, for that uh, painted lady butterfly to, to host on it. So that's what its larva feeds on. Makes a little rosette during the wintertime, blooms in the springtime, makes a little white fluff on there, and then dies during the summer. And so that's a cut weed. And then the painted lady butterfly, very similar. There it is on Tithonia or Mexican sunflower. And it hosts on thistles. And so my dad used to pay us to grow out thistles. So thistles are a native plant, edible plant, sunflower family. Remember I told you that was a good family for, for butterflies. It's a great nectar plant for swallowtails and it's the main host plant we have uh, for the painted lady butterfly. And so a couple of different lessons. First of all, every plant in the wild I can just about guarantee you it's a host for something. So try not to treat the wild like we do our gardens. Like, I want you, I want this color, you need to do this, you need to do that. Because if it's native, it's a host uh, for some butterfly or moth or some insect, and then there's going to be some bird uh, that feasts on that. Now certainly when you plant your garden, you've got a choice of planting flowers for, for butterflies, and so you can do annual flower beds, you can do perennial beds, you can do borders. Uh, but keep in mind if it's going to attract uh, butterflies and you know, I just didn't track bees too, but you got kids and certain people that don't want to be around the bees. And so you can actually just cultivate butterflies if you want, or you can do all pollinators, you can do hummingbirds. But think about those families, the sunflower family, uh, the verbena family, and tuck it in some pintas and flocks, and you'll have lots of butterflies. If you just got a single pot, put your verbena in the spring, put your lantana in the summertime, and you'll have butterflies, plenty of them. As a matter of fact, you're going to need a butterfly book. You're going to have so many that you're going to have to learn to identify them. So that's one plant in a big clay pot, um, a butterfly magnet. If you've got vacant space or country places like me, consider making a, a pocket prairie. Pocket prairie is just a miniature version of a prairie. So this one happens to be a quarter of an acre, but people do them even smaller than that. There are people that even do postage stamp prairies. I mean, the size of a pot or like square foot garden. So you can do little miniature prairies, not with garden plants, but with native plants. Uh, for pollinators and so lots of those things that on the roadside you think about it we mow our roadsides uh, based on safety and so they get mowed twice a year so the only things that really have a chance to bloom are the spring flowers that have grown through the winter time so the things that want to bloom in the summer get mowed down the things that want to bloom in the fall get mowed down and so of course we've got lots of problems with pollinators and monarchs because it's not like they work their way down the road with the flowers because there aren't any there so if you've got some place that you can grow plants and unlike a flower bed where we groom it and we deadhead it and we look at it and you do a pocket prairie, you generally want to leave it for an entire growing season and cut it down, or in my case, I burn it one time a year. So you need to do a wintertime cut down or a summertime cut down and then you want the entire uh, 364 days of the year for that entire life cycle. Every plant, every bloom, every seed, every chrysalis, every bud, and you get the whole complement of what nature, what we had long before we got here for thousands of years and before we start mowing and tending everything. So these are plants that I collected seed off the roadside, usually in front of a mower as they're going down the road, and I put them in what my dad calls my weed patch. And so it's what things look like before people got here. And so before we mowed and cultivated and planted everything, you think about it, we all, we all wonder why there are problems with pollinators, but think about it. The whole planet used to be covered, it was unmowed, untended, unharvested, unplowed, so of course, we don't have as many pollinators and so every person that visited Texas in the early days just went on and on and on about flowers as far as the eye could see and we don't maintain it like that anymore and so our only hope for keeping our complement of butterflies and other pollinators is everybody we go together kind of like piecing quilts so everybody takes their little block and does their little thing and helps it all along and we put it all together because we'll never have what we had before but yet you hate to lose uh, all those butterflies and, and bees and birds. So changes to the seasons. So in the spring I've got Baptisia and there's a Echinacea sanguinea. In the early summer, then Liatris aspera. In the late summer, the Tymonicalis uh, eulae, uh, Amaryllis relative blooming in the summertime there. Uh, there's the Liatris in full bloom. 
And it's a, the cool thing is when you leave it on its own, these are all things that I started with just a little bit of, and they just reseed. And so, just like the movie, if you build it, they will come. And it's fun to just put a little something in there. We're so used to planting things and having them disappear and having to replant it. It's fun to plant something that's supposed to be there and watch it spread and do its thing. So all I do, if it's a, an invasive exotic plant, like it was left over from my great-grandmother's house, so there was some privet and there was some mimosa and some things. If it's a non-native plant, I remove it. If it's a native plant, I don't care what you are, what you look like, whether you sting, bite, stinks, whatever, it gets to stay. So it's, it's a refuge for native plants and, and pollinators. And so there you can see some uh, a giant swallowtail working on the lattress there. And then, of course, in the city you can't do this, but in, in the country, uh, burning is actually our natural way uh, before people got here and we had fire trucks and fire suppression and all that sort of stuff. And so you can either, I don't I only do a, a cool season burn. Our nat natural fires tended to be warm season burns. You know, after hot and dry, we get in the summertime, fronts come in in the fall, you get lightning strikes, look much too dangerous for one person like me to tackle or most people to tackle. But you'd be surprised, about only about a quarter of this little pocket prayer will burn, then I mow the rest of it down. So if it's a small area, you just cut it down with the shears. If it's a decent sized area in the city, you just mow it down one time a year. Whatever doesn't burn, I mow. So it's about a, about a quarter of it burns and then the rest of it I have to mow with the tractor. Then I don't touch it for the, for the rest of the year. But the amazing part is the quarter that burns is 10 times better than the rest of it with the number of flowers, the number of plants. One reason for burning uh, is it gets you down to bare mineral soil. And so that's where the seeds germinate. And even though I love forest and I love walking on leaves and stuff, if you don't have bare dirt, just like weeds in your garden, uh, you don't have a ton of weeds come up in a nice lawn. If you got dead spots, you get weeds come up. If you plow up a garden, you get every weed under the sun come up. Well, that's the way it works in nature too. And so it's that burn part that's done the best, but you have to have grasses to burn. And I didn't have a lot of grasses to begin with. So it gets a little bit bigger, the portion that burns every year. Certainly you don't have that option in the city, but you do need to cut it down once a year, at least let the sunlight uh, get to the ground. I do the same thing with, I've got 20 acres of longleaf pine and I've planted a, a, a pollinator understory there with native grass and pollinator plants. And it's only about 10 years old now, but it's a, an amazing diversity of plants. And uh, I just burned it last week. And so longleaf pine is an unusual plant because it has to have fire. And so the weird thing in nature, the whole Southeast, if you were upland, you were fire adapted because before people got here, fires burned, not just acres, but burned you know, from river to, to river. And so any plant that was upland on a dry side had to learn to deal with fire. So grasses and pine trees intentionally start fires. I mean, they want a fire because they know it kills everything but them. And so pine seeds aren't going to come up unless you have bare dirt. Uh, perennial seeds aren't going to come up if you have bare dirt. Kills all the annuals. Perennials all come back. The pines get to regenerate. So certainly not something everybody can do, but it certainly uh, gets me lots of different flowers. And so this was actually a, a, a cut over forest when I bought it. And so just a mixture of, of Chinese privet and sweet gum and some few pines and whatnot. And so over the last 10 years, it's been amazing to watch all these herbaceous annuals and flowers. And um, some of them I planted, most of them I didn't. So the things that I spent lots of money on planting barely did anything. And then other things just amazingly showed up, which was really, really fun. And so it's been fun, fun watching all the flowers come up. That's a lobelia that came up that I didn't seed in there. That's a sensitive briar, which I didn't plant. That's black eyed Susan that I didn't plant. So if you let sunlight in and you cut down once a year, or in this case burn once a year, you will get native flowers come back from what they call the seed bank. So even if you've been 10 or 20, 30 years, there's seed laying in the ground there just waiting for their day in the sun, literally. And this was one of the coolest things. This is a plant called Agalinus or Gerardia. Didn't plant it, you can't buy the, the seed of it. And so in no time at all, I went from a few plants to a bazillion plants. And it's like a, it's called wild foxglove because it's like a little miniature foxglove flower. But it's the main host plant for the buckeye butterfly. And so before I even knew what it was, you see all these buckeye butterflies flying around. They lay their eggs on it. They make these funny looking little caterpillars there. There's their funny looking little chrysalis uh, hanging on a, a, some trident's uh, seed head off of a native grass. And then you know, comes a buckeye butterfly. And so once again, it has its own specific host plants. And if you don't have those plants, you don't have buckeye butterflies. So when you're looking at all these cool butterflies in your garden, realize you're doing a good thing by having flowers from the neck dome. But if they don't have all these plants in the wild, uh, you're not going to have butterflies. And so somehow we've got to perpetuate host plants as well. 
is nectar plants. We can't always do that in a landscape, but there are plenty of places, parks and pastures and national forests and uh, national parks and stuff that can be managed for such. And when you see things like a whole bottom land full of thistle, instead of being like my dad and thinking, oh my gosh, it's terrible, you know, we got to put some herbicide out there. And I love Clint Perkins to death, my co-worker, but there's not a day of the week that he's not telling somebody how to kill some cool native herbaceous pollinator plant with herbicide because every pasture and cow guy wants everything out of there but a grass. And so I always told my dad, well, these things grow during, it's a winter um, annual, a cool season annual. Comes up in the fall, grows through the winter, blooms in the springtime, pretty much, and even though it's spiny, you might not like walking around in it, it's dead by the time summertime comes along. So we grow warm season grasses, so it's really not competing with Bermuda grass and, and behaved grass, but our mentality is it's like a lawn. There's not San Augustine or Bermuda, we don't want it. If it's not close to Bermuda or Bahia, we don't want it. But the problem is there's a whole bunch of things that do want those things. And so best to look at it from is it native or, or not native, not uh, whether I don't like it. Because that's you can get all kind of butterfly pictures from nectarine, and then you, of course, get uh, painted lady butterflies. Most of us know uh, the uh, cloudless sulfur butterflies. There's actually a handful of sulfur, sulfur butterflies, and they're hard to, to identify. They mostly feed on anything in the legume families. All of these little native legumes, some of them that you can't stand, like the beggar's lice that stick all over you, uh, those are what uh, uh, sulfur butterflies get on. You'll also see them nectar on uh, uh, turk's cap and uh, red spider lilies in the fall. And one year I happened to look when I was working at SFA and what looked like an orange, I mean a typical sulfur butterfly, it had two orange rectangles on its wings up there. I'd never seen such, so I looked it up in the book and there was a tropical member of this called the orange barred sulfur butterfly that had literally blown in with, with a hurricane. And so sometimes if you're looking, and that's why I keep a, a book of Mexican butterflies in the office, because sometimes you get tropical butterflies that'll drift up and into the non-tropical areas and you'll see things that you wouldn't normally see. And so fun, but legumes for the sulfurs. Skippers, not the prettiest butterflies. That's the uh, white spotted skipper. There's a long tailed skipper. Mostly they're little butterflies that kind of look like a, a little moth, but they're butterflies. They have a, a hooked uh, antenna there, but they mostly host on grasses, Bermuda grass, San Augustine, weedy grasses. Uh, some of them on legumes, but most of them on grasses. Who would think that you had to have grasses? Have butterflies and of course the most common that we see is the Brazilian skipper butterfly on your canna so if you get canna leaf rollers which can literally shred cannas here during the summertime you can kill them you cut your cannas back just have them re-sprout ahead of the, uh, the larva uh, you can use BT on there and if you, if you really would just want to uh, blow people's minds you just tell them that they're butterfly haters and you're raising Brazilian skipper butterflies and it's supposed to look like that who would think that the, our common goat weed that all the ranchers and people can't stand is the host plant for the goat weed leaf wing butterfly? And so it's a real pretty butterfly. It uh, has orange wings. That one's tattered and about worn out. Uh, when its uh, wings are folded up, it looks like a dead leaf. When it opens up, it's this pretty orange butterfly. Never thought about it. One year I was working somewhere in extension, and a guy writes a letter and wants me to send him some goat weed seed. Like, why on earth that somebody will? Goat weed, or some people call it dove weed. It's a croak related to poinsettias and uh, castor beans, for that matter. But it's the that genus is the only host plant for that uh, for that butterfly. And so he was actually wanting to raise some butterflies at some botanical garden somewhere. So a rancher would want to kill these. A, a dove hunter, a quail hunter, wouldn't want to want to kill them. Well, as a butterfly person, you would want them as well. So can't have that butterfly if you don't have that that goat weed out there. How about this cool looking butterfly? That is the uh, purple hair streak. And so it's a, I don't get to see it a lot, but when you do, it's really cool because it makes the back tail end of its wing, doesn't have swallow tails, it makes a fake head back there. It'll have what looks like eyes, and it'll have what looks like antenna, and it'll move its antenna around back there, literally trying to keep everybody tricked uh, to bite off my backside and not my head. And so the picture doesn't do it justice because he's constantly moving his backside to make it look like his antenna are wiggling around. And so interesting looking butterfly. I don't see it a lot. This one was on the sidewalk outside the door of the Cotton Belt building a couple years ago, uh, puddling on the asphalt. And you think, no, that's not the prettiest butterfly in the world. There you see part of its uh, crazy backside trying to look like a, like a head. But the interesting thing to me about this butterfly is that it helps hit on the point of how important every native plant is. 
Does anybody in here know what plant this butterfly hosts on? I will give you an A plus and you can drop out for the rest of the semester. <laughs> And my class, when people used to just shout out wrong answers, also said if you get the wrong answer, you get an F, and you can drop out for the rest of the semester. So instead of shouting out wrong, 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 they're like, quiet. So that butterfly host on what used to be the state flower of Oklahoma. Does that give you my hint? Mistletoe. And so, I'm telling you, every plant out there is a host for something. And so that's the host plant for the purple hair streak butterfly, this mistletoe. Because mistletoe is a native plant, parasitic. Once again, people freak out it's going to kill the tree. If it killed the tree, the mistletoe would die. And so you may not like it, but it's not there to kill the tree. Uh, it's there to just kind of cheat and, you know, let me have a little bit of your bank account. All right, how about the red spotted pearl? We're getting close to finished here. Really pretty butterfly. Looks kind of like the other swallowtails. Um, doesn't have a swallowtail, though. Uh, beautiful thing. And this is going to blow your mind because it's, it's not just pretty flowers out there that attract butterflies. This will, you can put out rotted fruit. Uh, as a kid, I love picking up pears off the ground under old pear trees. When the pears get fermented, you'll see all these interesting butterflies like question marks and whatnot feeding on the rotted fruit. So this butterfly will get on rotted fruit, fermented fruit, so you can put your old fruit out there in a the tray uh, in your yard and see these. But it also gets on rotted carcasses dead animals, and the picture that I was going to show you, but it was so close up, I said, I can't show them a pretty butterfly licking fresh dog poo, because that's what the butter, it doesn't want fresh nectar from a flower. It like, and so when you run across this beautiful butterfly, one of the most nasty things you've ever seen, it's just amazing. Once again, if it's in nature, somebody out there is taking advantage of it. So that's why I, I don't like to hear people bad mouth buzzards and stuff, so better for them to eat it than you to have to pick it up and haul it off. And so, anyway, that's one feasting on a, look like what used to be a possum. So, remember this, John Muir, one of our most famous naturalists in the country, said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find out that it's bound fast by a thousand invisible cords that cannot be broken to everything in the universe. When it comes to butterflies, birds, caterpillars, native plants, they're all connected. And so we can't say, well, I want to get rid of poison ivy, and I want to get rid of mistletoe, and I want to get rid of tickle tongue because it's thorny. Because when you take out even tiny little pieces, it's like playing Jenga or something, and before long, the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. So a couple of different ways that you can do things for a, a pocket prey and have it look normal without your dad trying to get over there and bush hog it for you. Your weed patch. In Europe, they do a good bit of this, and so they'll have a meadow, but then they'll mow past through it. They'll have it in a rectilinear pattern. They'll have the sides mowed. So in other words, if you just turn your whole yard loose like friend Peter Luce did, they just think you died in there, and they're going to call 911. If you mow the edges of it, mow a path through there, put a fence, you know, mow out in front of the fence, have a split row fence, have your prairie, have a trail through there. So make it look intentional, and then you can pull things off like that. Uh, so, now, unfortunately, the roadsides are never going to look like what they did for thousands of years because we can't we'll have car wrecks everywhere. Uh, one, because I'm going to be on the roadside picking flowers and other people can't see when a deer jumps out of there. But we've got to find some way to grow those plants that are supposed to be out there in nature that have no place to grow anymore. And so we can do the pocket prairies. When you plant your garden, try to incorporate any native plant that you can. Try to incorporate any butterfly plant that you can. And so they all have to have a place and they don't have natural places anymore. So we've got to find a way uh, to help nature out. So if you want to learn more about butterflies, the uh, best two books that I find are Butterflies of Houston and Southeast Texas by Gloria and John Deaton. Uh, I actually got to hold the door for them one time at Mercer Arboretum. I think they're both, both passed on now. Uh, might be out of print, but you can find them on Amazon and I used to pick up every copy I can get because every butterfly that's here, it's uh, pictures of them, it's life history of them, what they host on, what they nectar on. And then Butterfly Gardening for the South by Gaeta Agalusk. She was a uh, Worked at the herbarium at Texas A&M uh, years ago and signed my wildfire book for me one time. And I think we have one of those as a door prize too. So great for our gardening for butterflies. So I uh, write a bunch of stuff. If you want to uh, follow along with pretty much everything I write, you're on Facebook. I, I repost my garden columns and other things that I write on my Facebook page at Great Grant Gardens. That's it. The end. Thank you.